Yeah, let's just go straight into it. All right, so uh, welcome to Room FM's first ever uh, hangout slash talk slash discussion uh, slash OTM, which is the word I would like to call or the word I would like to um, use to describe the environment that I want to uh, embrace in this discussion. So OTM is the pursuit of intellectual curiosity. It is a word normally used in Roman forums from ages of ages ago. You have buildings where people, people who are broad in their fields, specialists uh, in their careers, they come in and they know if you walk through the doors, you can strike up a conversation with anyone on any topic in any level of depth, any level of width in terms of your curiosity, and you can engage in conversation. That is the environment that I want to create. So if you don't know much about Rome, if you haven't really been using about using Rome for that long, perfectly fine. If you're highly technical, if you're not that technical, I am just as welcoming to you as I am to everybody else. So welcome. I want to talk about uh, Rome creators and in relation to that, what the future of Rome uh, can potentially be. So uh, some people who are here early, they've already seen this screen. So uh, welcome to my private Rome. Uh, Luckily, I don't have anything that is confidential on here, I think, but it should be okay. So on my sidebar, you have the information uh, that is on the Eventbrite page. So this is the essentially the narrative that we are trying to go through. So this is pretty simple. I want to start things off with my thoughts on the future of Rome from the perspective of a creator. If you're in the middle of wanting to create say, write a book or start an online course or build a community that is based off of a Rome graph or do, you know, engage in public speaking, but you have your Rome graph up to present, you know, things like that, all the possibilities. Um, this in relation to what Rome research will be doing in the future. So from multiplayer to API to, um, to hypographic features, can I quote other people's blocks into my graphs? What are the possibilities behind that? We first have to define what is a Rome creator. So zooming in on this first one. So uh, to me, a Rome creator is an individual who uses Rome to create something, to create X, right? We can have many different examples, but the most base level is an individual who uses Rome the tool for network thought to create something. So the foundation of their work is based off of their usage of the tool Rome, which means that with a universal tool like Rome Research, especially with the people who are participating in this group right now, our uses will be completely different. So my uses are completely different from yours. Matt's uses are completely different as you're based off of, you know, you're doing your Rome for teamwork course, right? And RJ's is completely different, coaching for singers. Rob's is completely different, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I will be calling out people uh, in this group uh, because I know you guys. So it will be all, I uh, hope you guys are, don't find that too embarrassing or too awkward. So what can it be? The more that we engage in this topic or the more that we have it circulating in our heads, I really want to ask everybody here, and if you want to speak up right now, it's perfectly fine as well. You can always interrupt me if you want to say something. Expanding on the possibilities, and I spelled that wrong, of a creator, what can they comprise of? What do they need? Do they need an audience? Do they need the tools? Do they need prerequisite skills? Do they need to be a writer first? Do they need to have technical skills beforehand, etc.? So expanding onto this, what can you make with Rome graphs? I've already explained or described a few, and some we can get into uh, in greater detail with a few examples. So going into this, uh, presentations or keynotes or public speakings, public speaking events. I believe we have Tracy in the chat. Yes, yes, she's in here. Hello, Tracy, um, where you've had the virtual summit for Roman journals. And in the midst of the virtual summit for Roman journals, you had a panel of multiple members who are showcasing the way that they use their Rome 
to show how they journal. In that way, or in that section, I remember watching this myself, so I'm pretty sure I have a good memory of it. Um, Brandon Toner showed his Rome graph and used the presentation shortcuts to go back and forth between uh, bullet points to showcase different parts of his workflow or his, in his use case, how he journals in Rome. So that's one way to create an experience, especially. You create an event, people come in, and then you present people to Rome. The next one is diagrams, workflows, and models. I think with the advent of drawing, you can create something here or there, right? You can create network taught, uh, networked models. You can create drawings. You can create anything you want. Quick sketches. Uh, I'm sure that I think Connor tagged Scalar Draw recently, just this morning, to see if there is a way to create an API to make this a little bit more robust. So for those who are more visual and they prefer a more artistic way of articulating what they're trying to express, this is probably a very important one. Uh, paired with this as well is uh, mermaid diagrams. I'm sure somebody else can chime in on this because I'm, I'm not that technical enough to know how to use mermaid diagrams. But we have, from a previous episode of Rome FM, we have uh, Khalil Corazo who rebuilt the business model canvas as a diagram within Rome. So in that talk, and I'm sure that I can actually bring it up right here. In that talk, Khalil used <clears throat> the, the business model canvas and rebuilt it in Rome. And this was once again referenced in another episode of Rome FM. Uh, uh, with the founder of Rome CN, Jesse, who saw that and saw its potential. So use cases already is that those in the entrepreneurial space, those in the startup space, find value in diagrams shown in Rome graphs because once they can find ways to do bi-directional linking from the way that they actually structure their startup or the structure their team on the business model campus in a Rome graph, that can, that can connect with everything else that works within their company. So that's one way to articulate value for a Rome graph and how it applies to that startup. So these are one of many examples, right? Uh, but let's go a little bit lighter uh, on the examples. So books is going to be a very fascinating one uh, to dive into. And I'm sure a few of us are avid writers here. Uh, if you are using Rome, I'm sure you have written thousands of words uh, in what I call the Rome itch. So the Rome itch is the addiction or the want to want to write something uh, in Rome because you know that there's this like possibility like, oh, what's going to link today, right? Or what's going to surface up today? Or from, my, from the thoughts that I penned down within my graph, how will I meet myself on this day moving forward? Or what will I delta a block to a different day and uh, send messages to my future self so that to remind them, of what their past self has learned. You know, examples like this, but back to this example, books. We have the standard definition of a book, which I will quickly <clears throat> describe or demonstrate here. And I don't want to be, I, I don't want to degrade people uh, in this way, but to really give a quick example, this is a book. A book is a closed context of information with a narrative you have the tables of contents. The tables of contents represent bullet points that spread out and detail towards more and more blocks, more and more sources of information related to references that are brought all the way to the, all the way to the back. So, if you think about it, each and every bullet point is its own page, and this is one graph. the 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 disadvantage of a book is that as we all know here, as we're all, all Rome users, it is very unlinked. So even if I'm reading this book, even if I'm following the narrative, even if I'm following the voice of the researcher in this hand, this is actually Altruism by Matthew Ricard, if anyone's interested in. Um, then what if we could find a way to visualize all the contents of this book in a way where they can be linked to one another and create a open book or a linked book 
where what you see on your screen is a 3D version linked of everything that is written here. Oh, I just realized I have marginalia on the side. Oh, that's interesting. So as an example, if I have a linked version of this book, then the text for this book will be within the graph and any annotations will be my own personal notes. So under the notion of, oh, I just said the bad word, uh, under the concept of Sanka Arun's is how to take smart notes, annotations are my own blocks resultant or nested under the references of the books that I am linking. So back to this, if you're a creator, what should you consider? If you are a creator, then you should consider an unlinked and a linked version. And we already have a great example of this right now with uh, Luca Delana, I believe that's his name, releasing a book called Ergodicity, which I will buy uh, very, very soon, which is fantastic, <clears throat> which is Amazing, right? So I'm just seeing some activity in the chat, so I will probably address that in a bit, uh, where I might as well just show it to you right now. And I think this is the correct direction for it. So he is selling his book in ebook format, an ebook plus Rome format, and then ebook plus Rome plus premium content format. So what this means is that he is selling an unlinked version of the information and a unlinked and linked version of the information. And the way that he wrote it was that he gave a quick primer as to what Rome is. And then from there, he created a linked one. Uh, he introduced the linked version. But so I'm, yeah, I, can I, can I just interject and here, or do you, I mean, what I'm really curious about with his book, um, because he has an unlinked version of it that you can just read linearly yeah. and a linked version of it. I mean, is he just as, I mean, I, I bought it because I want to see, but I mean, is he essentially just going to be like adding tags to each of the subhead, like each of the subheadings in any, in all the chapters and just like letting you sort the book like that? Or I mean, cause like Rome organization is very different than just adding links to a linear thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, that's actually a very good question. And I have to say that it depends because it's up to the author to see how they will organize their notes, right? So the assumption is that at least at least how I would do it would be if, if I have the unlinked book and then in the Rome graph, I have the start here or the book narrative as a favorite on the sidebar of the graph for the people who are already used to reading the book from the unlinked way. And then it's up to you to explore the contents of that graph in your own way. So let's... Let's actually, let's explore that. So I, I'll, let me explain to you what I mean. So let's, let's go back to here. So let's say this is an example book, right? You have your initial version, which is the unlinked, which is a PDF or dot uh, .mobi or on Kindle or something like that. And then you have the, and then you have the linked. So on the linked, you would have the start here page which probably explains something like, oh, uh, go through this graph the book way. And Rob, you and I actually talked about this in our episode on Rome FM, where we have to cater to the different behaviors of people exploring something. So there are those who would fall for rabbit holes. They see something that's pretty interesting. Let's just say ergodicity, and then that somehow connects to a gamification, right? And then that somehow connects to say, I don't know, like uh, Mark Robertson or something like that. That's one example. What the author has to do when you're doing something like a linked version is to introduce multiple ways to explore the graph. So like the above, this is the standard way. And the next one is to go by themes and topics. A bit like the, uh, what do you call it? The index. A bit like the index of a book, you have all the keywords and then you can explore it from there. This is very important because 
if Rob, you and I bought that same book, and then we are given different sessions to explore the graph ourselves, we will search differently. Like you will be interested in something completely different within that same graph. I will be something, I will be interested in something else. They'll be very interested. So we have to cater for that, like themes and topics. It could even be resources. It could be further reading. People might only be high touch. They would only go into the graph to search for, you know, ABC or a certain resource or a certain academic paper, and they will go and leave. I believe it was, who was it? There was a, there was a discussion recently on Twitter uh, brought up by Joel Chan, where a lot of academics would go into and read somebody else's paper to find people at the frontier of that field to connect with them. So that's already a very purposeful behavior behind them trying to search uh, a piece of content. We have to cater for that as authors in Rome. So that's probably one way to do that. I mean, if he's just going to, if the person is just going to like add tags on top of the book, I think that's a really, really big, like really bad thing to do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say bad, maybe there's a lot more potential behind that. It's like lacking. Like you're just emulating the book format. And I think that's not enough. So hopefully that gets your mind thinking. Yeah. I mean, I guess just some of my doubts there, um, and I can largely shut up after this, but I just think this is such an interesting area, you know, yeah. is, is that like with my public Rome graph, you know, like I was, I, I haven't been working on it as much lately, but when I was working on it, like I, um, was using a lot of page references, a lot of block references, and organizing things kind of with that. Like my goal was I want people to find information that they're looking for, even if they don't know what they're looking for yeah. relatively quickly. Um, problem with that though is uh, one aspect in particular is that block references, I think, uh, tend to be relatively low signal for the reader, you know, like they, they see a block reference and the block reference would bring them to some other area of the text, you know, but like you click on you, but like you never know when to click on that with like a page title, you, it's generally a little bit higher signal, especially if you take uh, Andy's notes about um, evergreen note titles seriously, where yeah. like the page title is supposed to give people like a scent of like this, I'm on the right path here and I wanna follow this. So it's like, I almost wonder, like, I, I, I'm i not sure if Rome really even is the best way to do something like this or if something like Obsidian Publish would be better for a non-linear book. It could be. And one way to do that is if there's a, like an API from Rome to Obsidian Publish, it could be possible. And actually, now that you brought that up, if something like Andy's notes promotes you to pick, say, atomic ideas as page titles, then maybe you have to rewrite the page headings for a book if it's in the linked version, right? So I, I, I think I, hopefully I expressed it well enough. Like if, I, like if I go through any book, these titles or these headings, um, they don't drive home the point. They only give you a tease as to what this chapter will be about or what this paragraph will be about. And the assumed behavior is that you will just continue reading. But if your goal is to capture people's time on your graph, each and every page needs to stand on its own. Each page needs to connect very, very well. So your goal is to you know, make it be so attractive that each page is like, ooh, what about this? Ooh, what about this? Not to, not, not to the point of like, being all clickbaity, but but more of according to what you said, like Andy's notes, like to have atomic ideas as page titles. Maybe maybe that's what one way to consider it. Never thought about that actually. I actually should write that down. So, uh, let me see. Quick look at the chat because uh, sometimes I. Okay, I'm seeing some points on. Copyright, uh, yeah, uh, I, I will be bringing up copyright later on because uh, that is something that we do have to consider for certain services that I think that would make a Rome career, but maybe are impossible uh, because of uh, copyright issues. So 
maybe not even research, just any book. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, let's see. So as well, just reading this out loud uh, for the recording, uh, Brian Toe says, I'm not sure about how the graph looks like. I think the graph also needs to detail how the writer wrote the book, micro details and the thinking to go into the graph and you can sell in the process of thinking really well. So yeah, um, uh, annotations and even versions of how the book came to be is probably one way of looking at it. Like that's actually a, a possible, that's actually one way to actually uh, see if it's worth even doing a book version, like a, a graph version of the book in the first place. Because if you just find the exact same text in the graph and nothing more, it's it's a pretty shallow graph, you have to say. Like, like there's elements of rewriting the page titles. There's also elements of making sure that there are things beyond the book that you can find that is worth paying extra. So in the case of the the ergodicity book, that's nine pounds, nine euros and an extra 20, 20 euros. That's that's quite a jump, right? That's like three times the price. Like what do you as as a as a consumer of something like this, what do you expect from adding buying something that's worth three times as much as just buying the book by itself? <coughs> things like link references, things like annotations, things like what happened in between, things like where did the author mess up? Like what did it result in? Failures, etc. So meta details is actually very, very great. Yeah. So as a uh, just to check. Um, oh, that's actually, yeah, reading the room graph version would be pretty good. Uh, I will try to save the chat for the text chat for this video and put it in the notes for this. And after that, I'll copy it over to the room FM graph. So anyone wants to refer to the transcript, which I'll do a transcript of this uh, call as well, and I will do it uh, there. So that's on books. I've got some thoughts, Norman. Um, when I think about yeah. a book, um, it's like someone's got their brain with all, with all their thoughts and knowledge in it. And you could think of that as a, um, I mean, people call their databases a second brain or whatever it might be. But um, when they go to write a book, I kind of see that as trying to flatten their whole complicated network of of ideas into a one one dimensional line essentially so that they can hold your hand and walk you through all these ideas and hopefully have fun along the way and you can enjoy it whatever it might be so um there's this problem of mapping one dimension to like a a, a graph right yeah. and uh one the, the the natural way to do that like if you didn't have to start with a book i would imagine the natural way would be the graph exists. It's like a mini Wikipedia or something, right? Everything's connected, all the concepts. And then there's a start here, but then it's, um, it, it's essentially just sort of tracing a journey through that graph, like jumping from plot to plot or whatever you, it might be. Okay. Um, and, and that opens up a different opportunity, which is uh, multiple stories right. among the same um, okay. Network, right? Yeah. So, so there's a possible. This is just a new idea or something. But given a knowledge base, um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can turn it around just to be interesting. But rather than a book and then just linking things, uh, start with a, a knowledge base, and then you can have multiple books, which are each different journeys through the the graph. That's actually a very good point to do it. Actually, yeah. Okay. Okay. I get it. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's like yeah, just like if. I don't know why I have to, my immediate image that comes to my mind is it's like a galaxy and then your goal is to get from one side of the galaxy to the other, but then there's many different ways to do it, but it's still the same galaxy. So yeah, and like a knowledge base and then you have all the knowledge is the same, but multiple books and narratives through that, like multiple threads. Oh, wow. I think that like tripled or quadrupled the work behind writing the book in the first place. Because then, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah like you would... But if you had the graph in the first place, it'd be quite right. yeah, straightforward. Yeah. Much more easy to write the book than, than it probably is now to just write a book from scratch. Uh, it, might, it might be easier. Um, 
Exactly. So you might have to think of like, what is the primary, most easiest narrative to think of through this knowledge base? And then have that as your Amazon, Kindle, sold book, whatever. But then that's obviously the easiest one to follow. So that's for the masses to read. But then once you're in the graph, you have multi multiple different perspectives, multiple different versions, multi multiple different narratives, multiple different books. Oh, that we're already unwinding yeah. the definition of a book at this point. That's insane. <laughs> Norman, do you mind if I, Norman, do you mind if I jump in here for a second? Yeah, yeah. go for um, it. One of the things that comes to to my mind because I do so much uh, coaching of of creativity is a lot of the hang up for people is that they don't you know, they look at a book and they don't understand how you get to a finished book. Uh, the, and it's one of the reasons that people love, cause I also come from theater, leave, love the behind the scenes kind of stuff is they love to see how things are put together. I think this concept that we're kind of fleshing out here really feeds into that. There's a lot of desire to know how things are put together. And it's really good for the world too, for people to see that the creative process is not a linear process. You know, you have a, you have a, a, a there's a lot of chaos uh, by design and should be. So that I don't know necessarily know that it is more work per se to have the graph in addition to the book. The graph is the the reason the book was able to come to be. And so I think that you're absolutely right that it's cool to be able to see different potential journeys. It's cool to see directions you may have started and then not followed, continued down uh, or you know various things like that. I think that's uh, just in my experience with the way people like to watch behind the scenes stuff and be engaged with behind the scenes stuff. And and I think that that would be something that would be really valuable and useful and interesting to people. Yeah, I think it's I think it's cool being able to go down those paths. But um, I also just want to point out how incredibly challenging <laughs> it is to write in a nonlinear way for other people to read and enjoy. You know, like uh, Andy Matuszczak, I think is one of the few people successful at this um i think but even then like i talked to a lot of people who are like i just can't really find myself enjoying this i prefer just reading like a long linear thing and like that i think that to an extent just means that a non-linear book is for a who's interested in that sort of thing but i think yeah, that's I true mean, like, yeah I, have, I agree but like i have my um you know i've since more or less ditched my public roam in favor of a um, in favor of a digital garden that's just based on pages, which I write in Obsidian. Um, and you know, I'm trying to do nonlinear writing, but like I, again, it's just it's very very challenging to do it in a way that's comprehensible to others. Note titles, page titles that you link through, are incredibly important, yeah. but. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's just a lot to be said about this digital medium. Yeah, no, I uh, read um, yep. uh, in, in some of Taleb's writing, he talks about, um, he kind of gets angry at these modern authors who would, um, who sort of write a book that's, that's highly structured, that's sort of encroaching on textbooks. And he's, he's disgusted. <laughs> by that he's disgusted by a lot of things but he's disgusted by that because um it, to him it, it's all about the, the the narrative and it's it, it can go anywhere at once and it, it's like the, the main concern there is really keeping someone's attention and it just there's you don't need that access to all the other information like you would in a wikipedia kind of setup it's all about just getting someone's attention and taking them from a to b and so i think you're right rob like you just maybe just have to focus on that single journey and um, hope you can utilize the links in some other way. So wait, wait, oh, wait, about, about that. What if the book is the chosen narrative, the primary narrative for that book, but the graph that comes with it is not a graph of that book. It's a graph of the author's findings in that field. And every other parallel narrative comes in there. So you yeah. do have the behind the scenes, you do have the annotations, you do have the failures, but the purpose of the graph is not to showcase, oh, it's just a linked version of the book, but rather the foundation of which that book comes to, to fruition. Maybe that's one way to like angle it 
and, yeah. and I think that's that's, that's sort yeah. of what I was meaning, and yeah. and and that the idea being that, and I've pre and Rob's right. There may <laughs> the market may be limited for that because people do need the narrative. I'm thinking because I have three kids of the Frozen Two on Disney Plus. There's Frozen Two, and there's also the making of Frozen Two. Right. But of course, the documentarians doing the making of Frozen Two also created their own narrative through that. It isn't as though the it's just a big old pile of here's what they did. Um, that said for myself when I'm creating and writing in Rome, whether it be creative writing or just content creation or whatever, the, the path that's laid down there, I don't know that my particular path would be interesting to anybody else, but I know that I am interested in seeing the way the journeys that other people have. So there may be, it, it may be the case that like Rob said, there's just the sort of thing that's interesting to the people that it's interesting to. Um, but I do think that there is at least a market uh, and and like was said in the chat here, I think that there is value too in the vulnerability component, being able to show that that the creative process is not a linear process in the way that a lot of times it's perceived to be. So as a coach, from the coaching standpoint, that to me is a really useful and interesting angle. I also want to point out that um, another challenge of nonlinear books. And, and so I, I will say, I think that this direction of like the Rome, the Rome graph being like the behind the scenes, the research, like that builds the book and maybe even like linking out that research to sections in the book. So that way people like are able to know, like, it's kind of like in a really big set of footnotes, yeah. <laughs> essentially. But, <laughs> like, um, but I think that uh, something to point out is that that's a challenge with uh, this nonlinear format is uh, the idea of like prerequisite knowledge. You know, like if right. you're right. just looking through all the backlinks for a subject, a lot of times you're not going to get the prerequisite knowledge and you're going to jump in halfway through, um, you know, it, and so it's not really building in a reliable way. And I think that's a challenge that any nonlinear writer, writer needs to consider. Um, I think that Nick Milo's um, light kit which he uses with obsidian publish is actually um one of the ones that's maybe a little bit better at this than others uh just in the sense that he actually like on his pages he'll like include a button that's that's essentially saying next <laughs> you know like uh, <laughs> to, to sort of have like little linear some linear flows within the uh hyperlinked graph yeah uh until oh, right. until we are better at um, managing images in Rome, yeah, all this is an academic game. At, we we can we can say it's a crying shame that people people don't uh, that that too many people pay attention to the eye candy, but it's reality. You know, people yeah. expect an online project to be rich in video and images or some sort of audio, but they prefer the eye candy and whether that's diagrams or mm -hmm. um, a quick snapshot of uh, a, a messy notebook where you actually work through a problem or a whiteboard or whatever. Um, pictures are a must. Uh, as part of the structure of any sort of long form writing in Rome. To that point, um, Art of Game Design is a book that I think does this, uh, illustrates that point really well. Um, it's like sort of like a textbook. It really should not have been written as a linear book. It would have been great uh, in a non-linear <laughs> format, but it's like, um, but it's like they have this index they have these index pages, right? Which, you know, have lots of subheadings that are very descriptive. But like when you're flipping through this book, you see, first thing you see on every page are the headings and the pictures and the call out like boxes of text that are in like different colors and stuff. So it's like, re so my point here is that it's really easy when you're flipping through this to see very quickly this is what I'm looking for. I'm interested in this. So I'm going to stop on this page and like explore it a little bit. You know, like uh, it, it's like giving the, there's there's cues beyond just the text. Like I think things like having headers are incredibly important for letting people quickly skim a 
that's interesting. See an image, skim a page. Is this interesting? You know, and on and on. Yeah, that uh, the mediums that go beyond writing uh, yeah. are are highly important. And I think the use case goes beyond that even like for not only for any book, but like academia for scientific research. I think of one of my previous episodes uh, with Cherry's son was a uh, greater support for images because she dealt a lot with her, her cultures, which she is working on. Uh, I think she's uh, working on fetal cells, I believe, like for research, like biological research, which is, you know, amazing stuff. But when you have limitations in doing scientific research because you cannot say upload or you cannot view images properly, they're not formatted properly, or you can't really share them out loud, uh, share them out to uh, other people, then that not only harms the experience of the Rome creator in adding value to the graph, but it also harms the experience of the consumer or the reader going through the graph and thinking, oh, like you're explaining this, but I don't see a diagram. I don't see a visual aid. I don't hear an oral aid, right? You hear an interview with somebody else, but where's the conversation? Like, I would like to hear proof. I would like to see findings uh, beyond writing. Um, actually, uh, a quick question actually uh, for Rob. I know you're doing your garden on Obsidian Publish. Do they have support for like really good support for beyond writing? Like visual mediums, videos. Oh, um, is it yeah, really I, I don't know yet. I'm I'm not okay. using Obsidian Publish for my garden. I'm using a Jack. Somebody made and I made a few hacks on top of it with the okay. help of people that actually know how to do those hacks. Um, but it's honestly there's I've put a lot of thought into what I think would be a really good UX for a nonlinear. A digital garden. I'm not there yet just because I'm not technical enough to make it. If, so, if one of you yeah. is, then I'd love to talk to you about it. But I think that there's a lot of things that could be done, um, again, beyond text that uh, with the UX that makes nonlinear reading better. Because again, it's just kind of getting at this idea of I want to help I, I think of this nonlinear writing as a book that rearranges its pages for you based on your interests, you know? Um, and, and I think that's kind of its best format, at least in my head. Um, and, and part of that means you need to encourage certain exploratory behaviors in readers. Readers aren't used to just clicking on a ton of links from a page that takes one to two minutes to read on its own, you know? Um, it's like, there's just, um, I, but yeah, there's a lot of exploration that needs to be done. Like uh, hover previews, for example, that's something that helps people explore better because that reduces the effort necessary to click on a link and see if it's worthwhile, right? right? Um, but, you know, if you add too many of these exploratory measures, then people lose track of where they were, get absolutely lost. I don't know. I think there's a lot to be done there, but uh, but no, uh, I think that Obsidian do Obsidian does allow for like images. Okay, I'm pretty sure it allows for YouTube embeds. Um, but beyond that, like if someone really wanted to hack together a nonlinear like a nonlinear book that has some level of structure to it, a uh, guided track that's that's one of the products that I'm working on. It's like a client company. Uh, I'm working on their onboarding right now, but that's really like one of the best places to go for that. Um, it's not going to be a pretty website, but it'll be a website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, looking at the chat, um, Rindula saying, just thinking about what everyone was saying about non-linearity. I think a possibility is to have, say, an appendix button, which allows people to go through a rabbit hole if they wish, similar to a latex button at the bottom of a slide where you can go to the mathematical appendix if anyone wants to see during a presentation. Okay, like an appendix button. So I'm not really familiar with this, but I'm assuming it's a bit like, sort of like a pop-up table of contents or like a pop-up narrative that allows me to explore in a certain linear fashion to prevent me from getting lost. Is that close to 
what's being described i think that's yeah it's similar so often so i i can only tell you because i'm coming from an academic perspective oh yeah, yeah. please <laughs> <laughs> we so i have to do a lot of presentations right and we have during the presentation you're not going to take everyone through your derivations of how you got to a specific formula right so what i what we often end up doing is against the big formula that we arrived at you kind of have a little button over there which can like take you to like a 15th slide right at the end of your presentation, which is the appendix, where you, you have all the step-by-steps -step written out. So in case anyone is interested, they can go through the derivation if, if they really want, so. So if you, okay, let's say, if you transpose that into a book, would you say have an appendix button for each chapter or each block or each paragraph? That would be uh, interesting. Yeah, why not? Because a lot yeah. of books do, right? A lot of books yeah. have like end notes or footnotes, which means like, okay, you found this footnote now from here, go to this end note. So, but but so the thing works. is, right? With but the thing is, with a with a book, it's it's very surface level. All it'll say is something like, oh, I got it from this source, and then that's it, right? It'll prompt you to go further reading or whatever, right? It will just tell you, oh, I got it from this source. If you do the same in a Rome graph, not only can you do something like, uh. This is the source where I got it from. You can also nest blocks underneath to say, how did I arrive at this paragraph? Or how did I arrive at this block? What did I ref what did I reference from anything else to arrive in this final form uh, of this book? And I think that's that's maybe one way to 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 address what Rob mentioned about like not getting too lost if you give too many exploratory options, but rather limit the amount of exploratory options to if you've arrived at this chapter, this is a button to take you to how did I arrive at this chapter? Mm -hmm. And I can maybe limit the amount of references to however number of blocks or fields or whatever. Maybe that's one way to do it. So I, I wish I had, like, I wish I'm really good at Rome, the Rome drawing tool. I don't know if you saw on Twitter, my, my Rome drawing sucks. So I'm just gonna pretend that I, I'm not, I'm just not a great drawing, but I would assume that it would be like uh, one timeline, which is the book. And then the graph is a, a notch on each chapter and you limit the amount of notches from each notch so that people don't get too lost. And then so what you're essentially is probably describing is like a centipede, if you want to think about a, a bit, it. Yeah, like a centipede. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like a centipede. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if, if we're going by the centipede analogy, if each section is two legs, then you can think of two different ways of exploring that same block, right? Mm -hmm. It could be, one is the scientific one, which is, oh, you go to the index of the resource or the academic piece that you should read for further reading. This is for the people who would like to read that. And the other way is, what is the anecdote or what was the conversation that prompted you to arrive at this block? Now that will be pretty fascinating because one, that is quite creative in terms of how, or like the behind the scenes of that block, and two, you limit, right? It's only just those two ways, right? It could be that. Like, um, I, I, that's, this, this is why I'm bringing this up um, because this kind of model or this kind of framework or this kind of referencing sources to arrive at these blocks, it's not just for a book. It could, even, it could be for a talk. It could be for a scientific paper. It could be for the makings of a video or a film, right? Um, you have different ways to arrive at each section of this finished piece, this finished product. Maybe one way to prevent people from getting too lost is to only limit exploratory options per section to like two to three, and then not let the graph grow too big from there. Yeah, so maybe a bit of a rant or a little bit of a <laughs> crazy deep dive <laughs> into what is possible, but um, as much as I'm saying this out loud, uh, I think it's good that people are really, really talking about this. So, you know, if you, if anyone has any extra notes, uh, if anyone has ex any extra notes uh, from this talk, if from your own personal graphs, I mean, I'm going to put this up uh, on the Rome FM graph and you can totally just add it in later on. You can give me a markdown file and I can just add it in, put it under your name. Um, and we can uh, swiftly move on because, uh, books took uh, quite a number of time. So let me switch back to sharing. So um, 
a lot of what we just talked about will also uh, would also apply to research deep dives. I don't have a proper name for it, but I just called it research deep dives. Um, academics, I'm sure, Merdola, you could probably chime in if you if you'd like. Um, when you have research, when you want to do research on a field, you want to make sure that you have all the resources set, you have a hypothesis, you want to explain it, you have an abstract, and then from there you write it out. Uh, maybe there's a way to do it, like a, some kind of workflow, sure. But then when you have a Rome graph version, uh, you probably would want to do this more in a collaborative manner with a team uh, or by yourself, uh, but it's a lot easier. But but maybe if we could, if I could just ask you something like, what was the difference between you researching something with and without Rome? Like, were there any changes in your workflow as a result? So I think the biggest change for me, and I think I've said this several times before, is that I was someone who used to only use paper and pen and right. use that. And I think one of the biggest issues I had was because I was thinking about like different angles of approaching the same problem, I would often have random thoughts. And I have an issue that if, if it's a random thought that doesn't fit on a particular page, it's not going to go on paper at all and I'm going to lose the thought. Yeah. And I think that's something, that's an issue that Rome kind of dealt with for me, right? Because that's at that point, because Rome took care of the organization bit, so to speak, I was able to like just dump my thoughts and then as and when they arise, I could block reference them and go back and forth between because I'm working on multiple papers at the same time, which are kind of related, uh, it becomes easier to just go back and be like, oh, okay, this is something I thought about with respect to this paper, but it's also relevant for the other paper that I'm working on and I can kind of link those ideas. So I think that was the big change in the way that I was working with and without Rome. Uh, so so to, to check that graph is, the graph that you're doing your research in is your personal graph, right? Yes. Not, okay. All right. So it's not like a like a collaborative team graph or anything like that. Like it's not one where you have multiple authors. Not right now because okay. my co-authors okay. unfortunately don't use Roam, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. but yeah. 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 Okay. That's an important distinction there. And okay, yeah, okay. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. That that's a very, very important uh, distinction because later on we probably have to start talking about different types of entities that actually interact uh, with a Rome graph, for example, number of authors, are there any clients, uh, who's the audience, et cetera. So if, you, if it's a private graph and the only constant connection between all these papers, all these thoughts are what you think of and your attention, like what you choose to pay attention to, then I guess that makes perfect sense. So like deep dives, research deep dives are definitely your specialty, so. If anything, if you have any notes on this, like I would love to see them uh, later on uh, after this. So um, moving on to courses. So we have quite a few uh, participants uh, in this call that have courses as well. RJ, I'm adding yours in because I know you are coming up with one later on. Um, and uh, from Tracy's Roman journals to Matt's uh, uh, Teamwork Rome online course to you know, Cortex Futuras and of course Nats. Uh, courses are definitely one of the most interesting ways to build, say, under the core of an information product courses or online courses rather are really, really good ways uh, of doing that. So uh, and this is just, these are just examples. So I, I'm not sure if uh, anyone here in the chat has anything to say about what are the implications behind making a, an online course about Rome and making an online course that is built on top of Rome? There's a huge distinction there because if you have a cohort or a group and they're all sharing the knowledge base in one shared room graph, what are the implications? So, you know, that's something to give you uh, something to think about really. <clears throat> Uh, so paid talks as well. Uh, so this is one example. So thank you guys uh, for being here. And Rob's recent one uh, on queries. So if you're a power user uh, of queries, so I'm sure that you've been to uh, Rob's talk as well. More and more people are finding value 
and being in this closed event space where we talk about Rome or we talk about things surrounding Rome or things that can overlap with Rome research, the tool and or the team and or the future uh, of the tool. So that's another way of creating things and communities as well. So communities is more of a, of a, a product or the result of findings on a Rome graph that have second order effects. So if you have a community, you define your audience, for example, um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, academic rooming, yeah, on Circle, as well as Nat's course community. So they're all built on the community and they're, everything in common is in Rome. So if you are a Rome creator and you're trying to build a group and it has to be, and, and Rome is involved in it in some way, you have to define what is the involvement of Rome? Is it just everyone has a Rome graph and you come together or is it that community is built on top of a knowledge base uh, and that knowledge base is built on Rome technology? Another example is Rome CN. So I'll just put Jesse's here. So to give an update, uh, Rome CN is the Rome China community and they have over 200 members adding contributions to the shared Rome China Rome graph. So think of the implications of a collective intelligence when you have the resultant blocks of over 200 members using Rome research. I need to ask Jesse about how she actually uh, inputs the information? Is it a matter of just like submitting markdown files or is it just a matter of telling people, oh, I'd like to update or do they actually have 200 authors on the same graph? Because that's a, that's, that's a whole other um, set of problems right there. So while we're talking through this, just have a think to yourself, what else can you make with a Rome graph? And you can totally uh, interject if you'd like. Well, well, so I'm really curious about this idea of online courses built on top of Rome, you yeah. know, like, so not about Rome, but on top of Rome, right? And I guess part of my in curiosity there, it has to do with its relative difficulty uh, for new users, you know, so it's like, um, I've tried doing collaborative databases before, like uh, like one time working with the client, um, I actually made like a quarterly report for them in a Rome database. And, uh, and, and, and the challenge there, in order to really use that well, people need to know how to use Rome well, you know, like, and, and like they need to know, um, one, they need to know like, even just proper Rome navigation, you know, like that you can open up pages, you can open up stuff in the sidebar, et cetera. They need to understand proper indentation, you know, um, in order to make sure that when you add in a whole lot of users that the knowledge is still gonna be structured. But then there also needs to be like some sort of common, just agreed upon practices, you know, cause like Rome doesn't just handle that for you. Like you maybe yeah. need to say like, Oh, we're going to, when you make a page, like try to build it on top of an index page or something, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like just stuff like that. Like, like it feels as though Rome is very challenging to create a collaborative knowledge database on for if people don't know how to use Rome uh, at the start. And also if they uh, don't have some common agreed upon rules. So I'm, so I'm just curious people's thoughts about that, especially Matt, uh, since I know you've been talking about uh, publicly about collaboration in Rome. Um, I know that there's things like queries you can do to uh, make pseudo notifications and all that, but like it, it still seems to require a lot of um, agreed upon workflow knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, our team is small, which is helps. There's four of us mm -hmm. um, that are using it. Uh, one one breakthrough that I made was uh, that you, you can't use daily notes at all. <laughs> like that, that just ruins everything. And uh, so I, I think I talked about this on our my call with Norman. Um, a team graph has to be 
inside out. So you don't put stuff into daily notes and then kind of point to stuff out in the sort of knowledge base. You, you have to put things into the knowledge base and then pull them in and display them on, on the daily notes. I found that that means that someone just enters and then on that day, it's sort of just showing them the important things that's happening in the knowledge base relevant to that day. So once input goes out into the knowledge base itself, it's, it's slightly easier because it's essentially like a Wikipedia thing. And if you had a whole bunch of, well, that's how Wikipedia is made now that I think about it, but um, people naturally build their own pages and, and conceptualize things however they would like. Um, and they're kind of free to do that on the outskirts. And um, uh, things like text sprints we've built into Rome as well, they're highly structured and everyone sort of has agreed on how that should work. And that's quite easy because no one wants to break that because it, it breaks how everything works. So um, one, one thing when you said building on indexes, that's probably the hardest thing, which is you don't necessarily know when new things have been built and uh, what to look for to find certain things. That That's a continual challenge that um, that we're working on. Yeah, uh, that uh, our, our episode's coming out soon, by the way. Uh, I'm working on that and mm -hmm. um, I'll be doing the transcript, so don't don't worry about that. Because uh, I used the transcript to actually edit the episode, so that's fine. Um, but okay. yeah, I, I remember I remember when I heard the analogy of uh, when trying to understand uh, Team Rome. So this is from our uh, episode, uh, uh, upcoming episode rather, that huge differences in defining what a collaborative graph can be, and that's because of that inside-out an analogy. Normally, we mm. always start as a private graph, like for personal graphs, we always start in daily notes. It, it's, always, it's always from there. And I think that's because you start, uh, each and every day is a reset, and you start the day with the daily notes, with an empty page, and then you implement the system. But when you have a team graph, or when you have a collaborative graph, and, and this is from like how I understood it from our conversation, um, the systems are already in place, and people are working to make it happen when they open the graph. So it's necessarily like, though the the systems uh, emerge, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I, I think one of the keys to doing a team graph is that you need to be okay with chaos. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a minimum amount of chaos, absolutely. And uh, by volume, maybe even maybe even like fifty percent of your pages are. Are junk but you know that, that's okay they're not important if no one's linking to them right so yeah. I, I picture it as kind of like a um like a just a just a star field or something just like the night sky and then as people link things up and reference things you start to get the structure as it pulls together and um it's fine that not everything is linked up um once you once you accept that you have to sort of tread the barrier the the edge of chaos and and that's where all the the beauty is because then you get all the nice connections and the structure emerges and so trying to fight for a structure won't work i think mm. we failed trying to enforce a structure <laughs> uh, i can't wait to work on that episode because uh just to see how different it is uh from then and now uh once you've been building your course so We'll have to see that. <laughs> Tracy, I'm I'm curious uh, your take on this too, because if if I'm not wrong, you're on the Rome team in a support role. Uh, so no, oh okay, I thought you were for some reason. Um, <laughs> never mind then. No, well, what were you going to ask actually? Well, well, I was going to ask. Be, um, I know that the Rome team uses a, uh, a collaborative database, and I've also seen them talk a little bit about how they do just about everything from the daily notes, which is uh, opposite hmm. to what yeah, okay. uh, Matthew was talking oh, wow. about. You know, so I, I'm, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, of course, you know, but uh, especially within Rome, that's kind of like what characterizes Rome. But, um, but but yeah, it, I just thought that was interesting. 
Oh, that would be really fascinating to see how the Rome research team uses Rome research to do collaborative work. Like, I think the biggest, the most interesting thing to see, what are the overlaps between Matt's system and the Rome research system? I think that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, Juvoni, uh, I don't know if any of you follow Juvoni on, oh, yeah. on Twitter, but, but he's talked a little bit about um, the differences between Obsidian's uh, the differences between Obsidian's product development and Rome's product development. And I saw that, um, I saw Cato Minor post at one point that he felt like um, a year in or however long he's been at, in it. And it feels like it's more beta now than it was before because there's just so many like half finished feature, half baked ideas and all that, you know, and, and, and Giovanni was saying like, he thinks part of that's just because like, Rome uses Rome to develop Rome, and that inherently does lead to a certain amount of non-structure, but yeah. I think I saw that exact tweet before. <laughs> the funny thing also is that um, I know that the Rome team themselves, they have multiple graphs, so not just their own kind of like um, team graph, but they also have their own personal graphs that they are working doing their own individual notes and their own individual thinking on. And you can see this also um, in the way that Connor does it because like Connor also kind of like, um, he sometimes he puts things out, he puts things out there and that, and he's thinking on Twitter, but he's not really uh, just thinking about um, within the graph itself. And then when you don't think within the graph itself, other people cannot see it. The rest of your team can't, can't see it. And uh, yeah, just, it's just interesting to see. Oh, okay. You look very shocked, shocked Norman. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's, that's, no, no, it's, it's not that I'm shocked. It's just that, and I'm just wondering about the implications of that, right? Because normally we would think, oh, all information about this team is closed within this one shared graph. But then naturally speaking, if you're on a Rome research team, you're probably going to have your own personal graph anyway. And then anything related to the company that you work for, in this case, Rome, you have a company graph. But Connor being Connor, he's going to be tweeting a ton each and every day because conversations lie at the foundation of all of his thinking processes. And his way of gaining conversation is all of his tweet threads and all of his findings and all of the flaws and uh, improvements and hacks from other people that he finds and discovers on Twitter. I mean, I can't believe that he only just found out about 42 just a couple of days ago. Uh, that that uh, blew he, my mind. He knew, but he, I think he was purposefully like um, ignoring it for a while. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. He's so focused on, on what he needs to do. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought he'd be keeping tabs because, I mean, it'd be pretty cool to just like... Yes, yes. Yeah, check out a few feature, features here and there. But yeah, um, collaborative graphs probably still in progress because we're seeing many different ways like Matt system is different from neuro research team system i'm sure we're seeing hybrids as well if they're going to have personal graphs plus their social media twitter graphs and their shared graphs um i will ask jesse for how she does her rome cn graph and maybe they can spark some ideas for anyone thinking of doing something collaborative and i think that's very important for everybody here in case you want to do something that involves another person other than yourself going into a graph. So that's, uh, I will bring it up later. I would like to share also on community graphs that um, that there was one for the, I was in the last building, the second brain cohort, and I set up a community graph where we can just kind of like merge notes. And the thing that I kind of found with that is the idea of engagement, where because there are no pings, there's no programmable attention of any sort, that um, it just kind of died as com and similarly to how you would use a forum, you would usually only be, like from my perspective, I think I'm only usually active in a forum that I am already invested in or I have like prior communication with. And it's not, it's interesting to see other people's notes uh, and different perspectives on the same thing. But if it is not connected to what I am learning or what is what my main kind of focus or output is, if it's, if that community graph is not connected to my own personal graph, then having to jump back and forth is, is a huge deal as well. Oh, it's friction, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jumping back and forth. Uh, okay. Yeah. My, new, my, my personal is completely separate from my company and it kills me every day. So, um, 
Oh, wait, so actually, actually, on that on that note, Matt, how, what percentage of your blocks built in your personal graph would you want to have copied over to your team graph? Like, do you think a lot about work related stuff in your private graph? And then you you normally have like the the situation where you're like, oh yeah, I should just copy these over. Well, I made my I had my personal graph, and obviously I had my work stuff in there. And then I thought, I want to move everything. I want to do like a health horizon graph. Yeah. So I built that and then one day I sat down and went, all right. And I just moved like copied and pasted everything I'd mentioned about health horizon on my personal across. Okay. And from that day, they've been totally okay. sealed from each other. They, they, anything to do with health horizon just goes in that, the company one. And um, hopefully they can solve graph linking one day. Yeah. Yeah. When it gets hypographic, uh, then Brian's problem from that will, will be gone because you can just easily link between graphs. Um, anyone with a Rome graph will be the audience for any Rome creator because anyone with access to another person's Rome graph will want to link it back to their block. So they're most likely to want to you know, pay for access or want to access for that later on. So yeah. Then we don't have situations where, where you know, you're, you're thinking of like, oh, I ended up thinking about work today in my private graph. Oh, I should just copy over the blocks. Instead of that, you could just like just block ref it over to the team graph. Then it'll make perfect sense. Um, I, I will bring that up later on uh, uh, after this because uh, I wanted to talk about filtering, like filtered graphs, because I think that's one way to consider like hypographic uh, possibilities. But yeah, uh, back to this. So we are already one hour plus in, but you know you don't have to if if you're like if you want to go to sleep, right? If you want to take a break to have a coffee or sleep, or if you have an appointment or something like that, I'm not forcing you to stay. So, you know, please, uh, uh, it is a, it's, it's for you to come and go. So if you're only interested in staying, that's fantastic. But yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. <laughs> and uh, if anyone else has, has any extra notes as they are, hearing this conversation as they're writing away in their own personal graphs and they're willing to add it in. Uh, I will email you guys later on which page to add this on and then I can just nest it under your name as a page and then we can talk about it later on. So um, in relation to everything that we talked about just now, then it comes to what are the different types of graphs that we can actually create. So we've already started deciding on um, packaging value through the format of a graph. But then there's different types of graphs. So for example, if you have a primary graph, a primary graph is you selling access to a graph or the value add is, or the end goal is the consumer or the audience wanting to gain access to a graph. So the graph is the product. That's what I mean by a primary graph. A secondary graph is when you have a graph that uses, that is the back end or the thinking engine uh, for a creator to sell something or to make something. So an example would be if you had the author from before and he used the Rome graph to create a book, then that graph is now secondary. You're not selling the graph, but the person is selling the book that is based off of the graph. Um, an example would be uh, if RJ's coaching system is based off of a graph, the value added would be him selling his coaching services through people but then the CRM, the setting up the calls and the interactions, the transcripts, and all of the resources will be in your graph. Then technically in your business, your graph is secondary. So that's one way to think about it. And tertiary is when value is added towards a client's graph, uh, which I will bring up later on. But think of this as a consultant. If you have someone who has a graph and they are having trouble with a graph or they are having trouble trying to gain more value out of their own graph, you come in as an outsider and you add value to their graph or you pay, or like they pay you to help with their graph. Uh, I'm seeing examples of this, examples of this like uh, growing over time, just little prompts of tweets here and there are people needing help with all the chaos in their own graphs. Would you be willing for someone to come in and see how things are doing with your graph and see if you can make more sense of it? There is actually some level of interest. So that graph becomes tertiary. So okay, think about that uh, uh, over time. And uh, inspiration for this tertiary graph would be that uh, Connor 
quote tweeted this, which is the, <clears throat> which is what he calls the state of X graph. Um, essentially, if someone who is trying to build an industry report on a field would interview 30 experts, summarize all the findings, compile all the research and then put them all in a Rome graph, then, uh, then either someone wants to get access to that. And then from there, they would you know, either pay that person to further add more value into that graph. That graph becomes tertiary. Initially it's primary and then it becomes tertiary. So that's one example. Yeah, so many different ways to think about it. Uh, and that leads to what are the different kinds of jobs. Uh, creator is redundant because it can be anything. So consultant, we've already just, just mentioned. Can you be a Rome consultant? It could be possible, right? It could actually be possible. Like if someone, if a company reaches out to you and says, hey, I'm interested in starting a Rome research graph database, but I don't know what's the best system or I have a startup and I want to get it set up. What's the best way? If I have a startup, a four person team, I approach Matt because Matt has a system on doing a startup system on his uh, own graph database. I want that for my own team. How do I do that? So you act as a consultant. Another one is the librarian. So the librarian is when you have, uh, for example, a, an employee or a member of your team managing your graph for you. So an, in, an in-house consultant, essentially, the in-house Roman or the person in charge of the Rome database. They're in charge of doing linked references. They are in charge of doing findings. They're in charge of setting up the deltas, the queries, et cetera. Uh, they're in charge of ensuring that all the information is up to date and they're in charge of you know, all the attributes and the metadata if necessary. Um, it's a lot of information wrangling, which can potentially turn into a service. And this may be coming in for way later. Oh, good night, good night, Matt. <laughs> this may be coming in for later, but uh, I think we're gonna be seeing more of this in the future, uh, the more that Rome research becomes really mainstream or be it becomes very normal in terms of parking all of your knowledge in that one graph. The scribe is the rudimentary version of that. Um, I act as the scribe a lot for a lot of my Rome FM episodes because I would clean transcriptions. I would add transcriptions of each episode into that. So I act as the scribe, writing down what people have said in each episode and putting it in a graph for everybody to see. So that's a very basic level uh, job. And oh, manager is the same as before. And uh, as mentioned before, the presentations, etc. the Rome orator or lecturer, someone who performs information or expresses information or someone who does a keynote on a field with a Rome graph uh, as, uh, as like an assistant or as a way to complement them trying to explain it. Um, yeah. Uh, other, uh, other, um, other observations include Rome as part of a job description. I, I need to find a tweet for this, but I remember that Listen Notes, the podcast company, is starting to host all of their knowledge onto Rome Research, and one of the prerequisites was experience of not with Rome Research, the tool, and I believe this was just earlier this year. So we are seeing. Room research actually held as a requirement for a job, which is pretty uh, interesting. I don't know. Oh, podcast notes. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, so not listeners notes. Podcast notes. Ironically, the podcast guy didn't know the name of the company, so I'm really sorry. Podcast notes. Anyway, so podcast notes. And um, yeah, so I won't go through most of these other than. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so uh, other use cases include a Rome as a service, which, uh, which I believe Mirdula brought up the copyright issue. So it does apply here as well. I did bring it up as a service to scribe a book into Rome format, but then how do you pay the author? 
where are the rights? What, what are the borders be between copyright? Like how do they gain ownership of this linked graph that everyone can get access to and then ref, like refer back their own graphs, right? Like what is the, where is the border behind like them being able to protect their own IP? Um, so scribing as a service for a book, turning it into a room format, probably impossible uh, for now. Uh, there's an article about, uh, from, about Google doing, trying to do the same trying to digitize every single publication. I think it's over like one, how many millions of books, but they can't release it. So they have an archive of digitized books that they cannot release it. It's like in a warehouse somewhere. It's like in a storehouse all the way in Google HQ or whatever, but they can't release it because how do you pay all of the authors, right? How do you pay uh, all of the writers as well? And uh, that does bring into question the moral values uh, of authorship. So I'll, I'll bring this up again. And what I mean by this is, and I don't know if anyone's going to have any uh, thoughts on this. So I, I brought up this, uh, of course, I, I was uh, having lunch with a friend and it was a group of us. And then one of the people there is a PhD. And I brought up room research because obviously I like to pitch room research to everybody else because if you're a room research user, you're going to do this naturally. It's as natural as breathing. So I brought up the notion of the unlinked and linked books discussion that we brought up earlier. I just thought that, oh, you know, to my friend, my PhD friend, if you were to write a book, what if you do a linked version? And he was worried from a moral standpoint in that in doing so, uh, we, start, we have to start redefining what is an author. So if you're an author and you have your books on Rome, are you an author of a book or are you an author of a knowledge base? So it's, it's, it's a little bit different there because when you have something as, you know, all the behind the scenes information, all the research notes, the annotations, et cetera, put onto this one graph for everybody to gain access to, it goes beyond just writing a book and then getting it sold to other people. It goes to, I'm selling my entire experience as a package. Are you going to pay for my package? That's a pretty weird innuendo right there, but are you going to pay for that experience and putting it on the public graph and exploring it on your own? So it changes the definition a little bit. So I just thought that maybe don't even have to discuss it, but as Rome creators, the possibilities of what is considered a creation through Rome have broadened. But to what extent can you say, put a paywall behind a graph? To what extent can you make this book free, but the full experience is premium? To what extent can you build an online course and then have members on a shared graph or not, right? Do you want them to be? Uh, and, um, and yeah, uh, and in the future, we have to think about these things because there are elements like the, uh, the Rome API coming out. So there's going to be the Rome Depot with a marketplace, all these creators and developers and workers trying to build extra additions, add-ons on top of one's Rome graph. So it's not going to be just writers and creators on a public graph. It's going to be people building like people like people like Rome Hacker, like people like 42, like building things like 42, but it's going to be a paid option potentially, right? On a marketplace. So that's going to be a whole other can of worms to open because then we have to think about the implications behind how do you pay for someone who, how do you pay for this tool that's going to be used in every single graph in like 80% of all the Rome graphs in the world, right? Like they think about that. I'm sure Connor and the team are thinking about it, but the Rome API, there's multiplayer, there's hypergraphic features like filtering, uh, like refing a, referencing a, a block outside of the graph into somebody else's graph. And I wanted to bring up the notion of filtering. So filtering is when, or a filtered graph is when I have my private graph and I create a premium graph in my account. And this will house this will house all of the premium information I would like people to pay for. For example, the linked version of the book or every single piece that I created, 
right? A linked version of that, let's just say. But instead of copying over all the information from graph from one block to the other, this graph will, will have the sole purpose of only filtering or referencing or block referencing all of the relevant blocks in my private graph. So it's only a graph full of block references and nothing more. And maybe pages for navigating through, say, a narrative or navigating through different exploratory uh, options. It could be possible. So that was pretty much all of my notes, right? Like I've been thinking about this for so long. Uh, I'm seeing notes from uh, one of the writers of Everything, the Everything Bundle, who wrote about Rome Research's possibilities from uh, redefining what a writer can be, what a writer can do, what an author can do. Can they do a paid membership subscription thing uh, for their Rome graph and many more. So with that said, that is pretty much it. Like if you're going to be a Rome creator, if you're going to use Rome to create something that represents you, what would it be and how would Rome be involved in it? That is the closing question. So, yeah. Is there a, does anyone like to add anything? <laughs> hey guys, this is Prob. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I, I was trying to remember and look up where I saw this. Uh, I saw it in a tweet. I think Connor retweeted it, but somebody was able to figure out um, the content creator getting paid on code and github and what they were essentially doing from my understanding i'm maybe not fully accurate but what they were doing is uh installing gumroad on top of a github repo and then the content creator themselves can sort of either license or sell their code into the larger network and and i think that's that may be a potentially a parallel in the near future maybe a medium future where a creator once the apis and stuff are available a creator by a Gumroad or a similar tool can sort of license or sell um, to the broader community graph. Um, that could be just one way um, mm. that I wanted to share, but it could be it could be very interesting, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of synchronicity between um, uh, Gumroad and Rome. And actually, that's actually a very good point. Like, if you could actually build the landing page and the transactions, et cetera, on Gumroad. And that is the layer on top of the service that you're giving, which is, for example, the licensing of a tool or something like that. I think that- Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that opens up possibilities. Like, hopefully we can get that out like and test it out to see if it's possible. At most we can do with a Gumroad is, uh, I think Shu Omi is doing this, where you pay for access to his notes, which is on a graph. Like, you know, it's, it's straightforward, it's understandable. Right. But then how can Gumroad take how can Gumroad care for licensing per usage of a tool? And if they worked it out, I think that'll be uh, fantastic. I think I would love to hear Connor's take on that, actually. Like, can he implement that? Or is that just going to be an API thing? It might just be it might just be an API thing. Mm. Okay. All right. I mean this with the assumption that the graph is not evergreen, the graph is kind of like fixed in a fixed state already, it's just linked. It's, uh, it's what you call the second, the secondary already. It's, it's, linked. it's linked already, it's just that um, it is final and there's no further updates. Unless it is, you kind of like, you make an entire new graph, like this is version, this is graph version one, this is graph version right. two. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. You, you, you charge for the next, the next, um, like you kick everyone out and then everyone that pays for version two gets access to version two, or you just tag version two and then um, only these blocks can be seen by these particular people. <laughs> oh my God, limit access per block. <laughs> Sorry? Limit blocks by access, like yeah. li limit by access to blocks. Yes. Wait, it is, it is. I, I'm sure it can work. Like I, I've had a few discussions on Twitter on uh, pay per block view, which is yeah insane. Um, yeah, but um, I think these guys are also the ones that, I mean, to me, one block does not really make a much a difference. What matters is the context of the block. What matters are the links that the block goes to. I don't care for the writing 
the one block in itself as much as I care for the atomic, like a little bit more. Like, no, I don't care for the atomic. I care for the context. I care for the links, which is why I would, I would go into a graph. And if not, I'll just kind of Google it. Or right, just... yeah, see, yeah, see that, that, that's what I mean, right? Like, so that's why I think pay per block is too, too, too atomic that it's worthless. Like you would want to pay per even page or just pay for the whole graph because the assumption is that every single block within that graph helps with allowing this one block that you're interested in uh, be completed. I, 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 that's, that's the, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like it's maybe paper block is a little bit too much right now. Cause we're not even, we, we are not even at that stage yet. Like this might be thinking a little bit too far ahead. It's just that on what Prob is saying, uh, licensing via Gumroad, it can work. I'm assuming that updates can also, you know, update really well if you need like extra, uh, extra additions to whatever the service or whatever the tool can be, they can add it to your graph and I think it'll be pretty easy. So that's right up Rob's alley because uh, it's sort of a gamification. Do you earn points to get to see that missing piece of that graph or <laughs> do you actually buy it? Oh, like a pay to win thing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Another tricky one is uh, I, I don't know where I saw this. I think it was yesterday. I was buying something on Gumroad. Yeah, I think it was a Gumroad product, to be honest. I think they were doing a seminar or webinar or something like that. And the question it asked me is, what do you think this is worth? And I was like, oh my God, what? Um, <laughs> that was a very clever question to ask. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a very Gumroad thing though, right? It's like, there's like the, there's like the, yeah, the base yeah. price and then there's like the minimum price, right? Which is like the, like $5 plus or something like that. It's like, oh, you can pay however right. much you want, right? It's like, what do you think? It's, yeah. I, think, I thought it was creative. I think uh, something like that could also work because uh, from the uh, content creator perspective, it's often um, where the price your uh, product or service is, uh, especially for new beginners, is quite the, it's quite the challenge. So what that does is sort of punt it until you try and figure out what people are comfortable paying and maybe go for that range. Yeah, it also serves as a very good wide net as well because... And I mean, it's, there's like biases against trying to price ourselves or trying to value ourselves. And we put ourselves as a price that's a little bit too low. And then sometimes we have customers or uh, a certain subset of the audience who thinks that we are worth more than the price that we put on ourselves. So I think it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm just wondering from a Rome perspective, can you do that per block? I think no. And I think it would just be easier to just do that for access. And then that's it. And then maybe have a fluctuating price. Like the... One of the things I was thinking of was if like, if I just put myself as an example, because I'm planning to do this anyway, I'm planning to create a premium graph of every potential book, every potential fictional story, every potential article I've ever written linked with each other into one graph. And it's a fluctuating price or it's a price that increases over time. The more I put a completed product in, um, to balance against that, like undervaluing of myself. Like that's, that's one way of looking at it. And I was going to test it uh, later on uh, over time, but it's, it's good to know that maybe Rome doesn't even have to care about this part because you have Gumroad tech or somebody else is going to come in with like a really good payment system that works really well. Like, are we going to pay with credit, right? If I put like a thousand dollars into block access dollars or something like that, then I can, take bits of premium for other people's graphs, et cetera. So. Yeah, I, I don't permissions is in any way sustainable for the author. You know, it's just like a lot of work. Um, you know, like I, I, I honestly think that something to the tune of, you know, like this sort of system I implement, I implemented with Rome Hacker for Rome privacy mode. I think that could work. Uh, pretty well with sharing a public graph where you're essentially saying like, here's a list of pages that I don't want people to see. Um, and it's just going to make it so they can't see anything that's tagged with that page or indented beneath it. Like it's the same thing as essentially like, like, like really just this idea of being able to write a query 
you know, and say like the results of this query will not show up for person for a person. Right. You know, like I, I think that's the general idea uh, that makes this sort of easier. Like I see a lot of people get hung up on things like a uh, first degree and second degree connections and all that. Um, honestly, I, I think just that indentation side of things yeah. covers a lot. Uh, it, like, like I mean, I I don't know. I think that a lot of users, a surprising amount of users, I'm working on a video on this right now, but like a surprising number of users just don't understand that indentation literally is how you convey connections in Rome and like that you kind of just have to do indentation, yeah. you know, like they don't get that, right? Um, but but it's like, that's just how it works, you know? So like, I, so like I think a system like that uh, would just sort of drive people to do a little bit better within Rome. I think that any public Rome writer should be doing something like that. Yeah, so, uh, some level of standards uh, in a public Rome graph would be fantastic. Um, I mean, it's really indentation. That's it. Yeah, yeah, That's it's just indentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we are in the beginning stages of Rome, like very, very early stages. Only just got out of the beta. Like, mm -hmm. um, and the the API beta, or I, I guess you could say the beta API, is only just come out. So maybe there's a way to fix all these things or fix all these different mindsets. Uh, uh, some people may just choose not to indent so much. Maybe they choose to visualize it a little bit differently. Maybe they choose to be very page heavy. Uh, I prefer block heavy. I prefer indentation. That's just how I work a lot more and a lot of block refs. I mean, we talked about this on Twitter, but like um, yeah. the as much as the power of Rome lies in indentation, which is probably the the most empirical way of showcasing, hey, this block is related. It doesn't yeah. seem that way at first glance. Like mm -hmm. to like at surface level, it just looks like a bullet point and a bullet point. But in Rome, and indentation means so much more. And then you just have to worry about teaching them. So yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm excited for that video actually. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we, we are finishing up, but if you wanna, you all wanna chat I'm perfectly, uh, I'm perfectly up for it, but I just wanted to close off with a little announcement for Rome FM itself. Um, uh, I, I will test out uh, one of the Rome, creator business models by making the Rome FM graph premium. And what I'll be doing is I'll be doing the show notes and the transcript uh, up for free on public on my own website. But if you want to see the linked version, it will be in the Rome FM graph. So people can still get access to in the, in the information, but I'll just have it uh, in the Rome FM graph. Um, if you're in this call, hey, you, you, you get access for free. So don't don't worry about it. Uh, I I I want this to be like the I I want to be the guinea pig for a paid graph over time. So the current the current thought process is, as Connor would put it in the very beginning, because even he re he recommended this as well. It's a five dollars one time price to get access to the graph. And so I'll be running that for quite a while, and then later on I might just do like just one dollar a month subscription for anyone else uh, outside of this call uh, later on. And for previous guests on the show, it'll be free access. So, I mean, we have already a couple of people who have already guested on the show here. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but for guests who have been on the show, uh, it will be free. So I have all your emails. So later on, I'll give you instructions or I'll let you know, right? Like hey, you now have access to the graph. It is now closed, but you have access as a viewer. Um, and the reason why is because I want to... Oh, okay. Yeah. See you, Rob. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because I want to make this sustainable. Uh, Rome FM is becoming a lot bigger than just a podcast. Uh, it's more like a beacon of attraction for weird Romans to, oh, he's doing the, <laughs> I, I saw that. <laughs> Brian's doing a, a, a hand version of my logo. Um, so um, 
Around FM is becoming a lot bigger than just a podcast. It's becoming this account that people follow for just welcoming people into the community. And I want to sustain that, which is why I have to put a paywall behind the biggest time, time suck of the entirety of Rome FM, which is the maintenance of the graph. So with the payments, what I'm doing is that I will, I will use that to sustain more talks like this. So you guys are, you guys are all in, so you can come in for free. Of course. And Dude, I'll pay. Like, oh. <laughs> it would be nice to have access to mine just to proof it. But if I need to know something from another guest, why shouldn't I pay for that too? Okay. I, you, can, you can make us the payment guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of you and, and I think this is a, a great idea. Just make sure that you understand that that when I buy when I buy somebody else's interview, um, that's valuable to me. So make sure you give your friends the option to support you. Okay. Sure. Yes, agreed. hundred yeah. percent. All right. Well, I will, okay, so what I'll do is I'll, I will, uh, it's, it's going to be on Gumroad. So Prob, thanks for the uh, amazing coincidence in bringing up Gumroad. Um, but I will, I will do a, um, I'll add a coupon for, get, uh, for those who attended the call to have it for free, but up to you if you want to do a, a lot more. Um, it's just that in the beginning, it'll be like a one-time price later on, it'll be, uh, subscribe because I've been talking with another uh, another upcoming guest who is another fellow podcaster, uh, Albin from uh, Buzzsprout, uh, that we might do like a subscription to like different tiers for just access. And then another one is a little bit higher for events like these. Um, I will play the role of librarian, scribe, and deep thinker through maintenance of this Aroma FM graph. So being able to sustain, like have food on the table to allow me to do this would be fantastic. So that's that's my big announcement. So I'm just letting you guys know uh, beforehand. So there'll be new pages within the graph. So one is like, one is called Rome Interesting and another one is called Future of Rome. So Rome Interesting is just interesting connections that I find just by running around the graph and seeing what happens. And Future of Rome is more on specific elements of the transcripts of episodes that I feel would be very important if you want to think about what is happening in the future of Rome research, or maybe it's just tweets that I'm noticing from here and there. So think of it as like a curated feed of anything Rome related and you guys have access to it. So yeah. And um, you guys, honestly, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. So the talk is officially over. Uh, if you want to message me, whatever, you can always tweet at me or just DM me. Uh, I like either on my personal Twitter, uh, Twitter account or my Roma FM account. So this would be uh, fantastic. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Norman. <laughs> thank you. So if anybody is interested in doing um, a course, um, I, I'm happy to share what I'm learning in that space. So um, happy to just visit with you about about that. I, 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 I promise that for sure early on, um, if I can just share um, even data about um, how I put things together uh, to sort of pave the way, I'm, hap I'm happy to have that conversation with you uh, and tell you the you know, what the numbers are, what worked, what hasn't worked yet, uh, where I'm headed. So uh, I just, I, I want us to, I want us to be able to support ourselves in this community. And, and I'm really proud of you, Norm. Thank you. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for putting this together. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, the floor is open. So if anyone wants to bring up anything, perfectly fine. Uh, we'll stay here until the last member is standing. Uh, otherwise, Tracy, we can probably like think about that as like a talk or another Rome FM hangout and then bring an audience in to talk about like findings behind trying to set up a Rome, Rome related course. Because um, I'm sure a bigger audience would be interested in like 
a large use case or an example, if you're willing to share the numbers, right? If you follow the Sure, yeah. happy to do that. Yeah. It, it, it seems a bit meta to, um, to do this, but I've sort of been toying with the idea of creating a, a Rome graph about building a Rome course, but I just mm. haven't done it yet. So I don't know. You could do that collaboratively, actually. I think it's a really good idea. I know yeah. I was just, when I was doing the task management course, I was just literally just making it all up as I went. I mean, I think it turned out okay, but it was, I didn't know what I was doing. Turned I never great. even worked on Teachable. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> but, <laughs> really I mean, I've taught course, stuff before. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I, yeah. I knew how to structure stuff, but I'd never done it that way before. And I certainly didn't, you know, so no, I, I think that would be a really valuable resource. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Maybe even a separate group or something to, because the, for me, the hardest part was uh, between my ears, like, and, and I've got 30 something years of experience in uh, video editing. And that was stressful for me. Um, but yeah, I, I actually had a coach in terms of content creation who helped me put together the marketing pieces, but the actual creation of the course it's the hardest thing i've ever done and i've 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 done some really cool high stress high profile uh winner take all everybody's watching stuff and it's the hardest thing i've done easily mm. yeah i i don't know i i've not i've never been in like i've thought about making courses before but to make it surrounding room to me is i'm completely like blind about it i have no clue what to even consider uh at first i would think that it's the same principles as just starting any online course or creating the materials for an online course mm -hmm. except that i would think of the rome as secondary so i just use it as the back end i wouldn't show the rome graph to the user but then if you want to make it primary then it's like hybrid right it's like the product course mm. and the primary which is the graph that people get access to oh wow even managing that sounds like a load like i think interesting higher aroma yeah that but... becomes <laughs> you, you it, in my experience you can either build a journal and a graph about building a course or you can build the dang course <laughs> i tried to right. do both and it just wasn't possible to take my interstitial frustrations and put them in a form that I felt comfortable sharing, <laughs> you know? Because I, I thought about it and I thought, yeah. you crazy girl, you just gotta build a stupid course. So I don't know. I, uh, I think there's it is something so easy there. To, sorry, it's so easy to head down those uh those pathways because they're especially with rome there's like a, a trillion different potential applications of the thing and so every every little side journey is a, a potential new aspect of the course and and you know just the the mere yes. act of of figuring out what to weed out which i mean is central to any kind of teaching and instruction but it's still uh, you know rome itself has a lot of that going on and i think that's that's as I'm doing the course that's coming up that I'm working on, the Your Road to Rome, that's a, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it because I love doing that kind of stuff, but figuring out uh, when I'm trying to help people recognize what their own journey through the thing is, it's hard because you don't, you, you got to cover a lot of stuff, but you also got to not cover a lot more stuff <laughs> and figuring out what you're covering and what you're not covering is, is, is a real challenge. Oh, it's even more insidious to me because those rabbit trails become an excuse for doing something else instead of the work. It, it's total Stephen Pressfield resistance. Oh, and now it's like bi-directional resistance, <laughs> which <Yeah>. is insane. <laughs> yeah. So it, to me, there almost needs to be more than just teaching and tutorial there needs to be a support group for us you know first second and third time uh product creators even inside this very narrow niche of rome yeah 
I, I'm seeing I'm seeing the the teaching model of building a second brain or rite of passage. I think Brian, you can probably chime in on this. Uh, the way they do their cohorts is definitely ten out of ten. It's closed off groups within a number of weeks. You have the course, and then you have the 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 intimate instructions from the instructor themselves. Maybe it's like closed sessions mm -hmm. where they're talking to each other. And the support group is fellow students. Um, yes. Which works that's really, totally really well. Where, yeah. that's, that's probably going to be my, my premium journaling product. That's, right. that's going to be the upsell from uh, uh, the Roman journal self-paced course. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's probably the best bet. Um, like in my head, if hypergraphic features come out, if you have a graph for your course, that premium section, that premium version, people can block ref their interstitial journaling as examples. They block ref them into that graph as examples. So previous cohorts can showcase how they have journaled to success or how they have started or start the habit of journaling. Yeah. You ask them like, hey, can you block ref the first day that you started journaling? Because my students are having trouble trying to start. We're like, what's the best way to do that? And if they could share a block mm -hmm. that they don't mind sharing, you know, it's like a little bit of vulnerability, but enough to get things going. Then you can show that as a case study of, sure, this is how people start journaling. You don't have to be, flawless at journaling from day one. Don't worry, right? The most successful of journal people, the more successful are writers who start journaling. They, they start with crap on their first block, right? They start with like barely anything, like a mess of words. Like if I, like if I could potentially block ref the very first diary entry from like 10 years ago or 15 years ago into your graph, it might help somebody because mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, I was a very different person from like 10 years ago. So even I don't oh, want to read so. my own notes. <laughs> but um, but it's it's not even about the content itself. It's about the proof of action. And yes. it's the, the proof of action from someone relatable, which is very, very yes. uh, important. Uh, like and that. yeah, in the use case of journaling, that vulnerability helps with being relatable. So I think... Uh, I think like once you go, once we go hypergraphic, like you can go with so many different options. Like I am just waiting. For, I can't wait to go hypergraphic. Like I want to, I want to ref other people's blocks so hard. Like you don't understand. Like so, the thing is, okay. So here's something, right? And and I mean, I've been recording this entire time, and we're probably I'm gonna post this somewhere on YouTube or whatever. But it's okay. I'll just have this out here. Um, I I act very differently as. Rome FM Twitter and as someone who is doing like an episode with someone and uh, Tracy, you, you can probably relate or chime in. Um, I'm a lot more calmer when I'm just talking, say with just you one-on-one -on -one, and we're getting very introspective on certain things. We're getting deeper on serious issues, etc. When we're in a group setting and I'm talking about Rome, like my voice goes like crazy. Like it's, it's insane. And that reflects a lot in my Twitter account. Like I make a lot of random jokes. I banter with people. Even if I have moments where I do long tweet threads of like things that are very exciting to me, uh, Rome related, half of the time, I feel like I'm just messing around. And for some reason that's attracted people. <laughs> it's a play. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I'm sure that's valuable in some way because uh there, there is a certain that there is a <laughs> Brian. <laughs> uh, th there is a certain uh, uh, there's a certain image or impression of Rome cult uh, in that the barrier to becoming part of it can be scary to some people who are starting up Rome yeah, for the first time. For me. Yeah, yeah, sure. It can, it can be. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I can attest to that. Um, hmm. Although to be fair, I think I was there before someone actually coined it, which is weird. Yeah. Anyway, so even just seeing the hashtag everywhere, right? It's like you're meant to. It sounds like it 
it's almost like a mandate. Like it is mandatory for you to tweet anything about Rome research by hashtagging Rome cult. And I made a joke tweet, like maybe last month or something. Like if this tweet, if a tweet is talking about Rome without tagging Rome research or hashtagging Rome cult, is it a tweet about Rome research? And I said that as a, like a joke. I just, I'm just, you know, I jest. But I remember thinking to myself after I wrote that tweet, because obviously I thought it was funny. Isn't it true, right? Like in my head, I was like, oh yeah, it could be. Yeah, so I hope that- It's uh, true because, it's funny because it's true. Yeah. 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 So I gotta I, hop off. I would, I could sit here all day long and visit with you guys. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for putting this together. It's so good to see y'all. Some of my favorite people. <laughs> no <Much> worries. Love. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Yeah. There's actually a couple. There's actually um like two frameworks that I kind of want to be able to try and work on. That I kind of want to hear your opinions on if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think first things first. Like as a creator, like your creator is not just within your content. Your create is not just within the text. I think that. The links themselves are the monetize of are like what you're monetizing. You're not monetizing the content itself because like all writing is rewriting and like essentially, essentially all data database of your knowledge is the sum of what you think about something and like just and and what and your references, right? And right. It's interesting that you mentioned the the work of a librarian because why can't I sell a graph? Because I'm not selling content. The content is is belongs to someone else. I'm not selling the content. I'm not giving them the entire book, but I'm selling them the connections the book is being based on. So essentially, if I say I read a goddessity, right? And I'm thinking along a goddessity, I'm explaining where did this come from? Who is this person? Who is this person that first said this? What inspired him? And I'm chaining all these things organically in an ever-growing kind of format. Wouldn't that be... Um, kind wouldn't that be a monetizable uh thing in itself i'm not monetizing the a goddess city the book i'm monetizing my notes on the book and yeah that's a concept of a digital garden but in additional because a di digital garden is one that kind of captures your own thinking in your own words right like uh and also just kind of put evergreen notes are atomic and they are in your own words that's that's how he phrased it yeah but you're not monetizing content you're monetizing being able to link the references you're monetizing having a personal not just a personal wiki but your own personal notes and that is your form of creation so that's something i was thinking about along this course like the links themselves are something that us are a product yeah and um so something I've been really wanting to do. Have you guys watched like Midnight Gospel on Netflix? It's like this kind of podcasting uh, show. It's like a cartoon and it, it goes very deep. And I think it would be very interesting to kind of just like have, say like, uh, do you guys know uh, Netflix Party? It's just this extension that allows you to sync with your sync, that kind of thing. Imagine, right, yeah. watching, imagine watching a film and then with some form of extension or just having the graph next to it because right now, Rome is a very text-based thing. But what if we go in the opposite direction of like, instead of trying to transcribe a book, but we are, trans we are taking from visual audio to text. We are using, as the movie plays, we are going towards, uh, like the notes are, are showing up alongside. Ah, okay, in the side. right. Okay. In the side, uh, and then you and then like the guy says something. The guy, guy says something interesting. Then you're like, hmm, wait a minute. They just pause, and then you, and then you go, you go for your exploration, that kind, that kind of thing. And I think, I, I, I think that would be something that is very cool, and it's something that I would like to experiment, um, in the future, I, in in the future, yeah, and especially for dance movement because if I'm able to do. If I'm able to break down dance movement into like choreography and then into segmented blocks, and I'm able to search the blocks, individual blocks, and thread them together, and be able to interpret and move, um, dissect my own movement, that'll be that'll be crazy for me. And the second thing was instead of thinking of like a book as kind of, so there's like one monetizing monetizing 
monetization framework of that I was thinking about just having and you can probably do that for your for your podcast itself. Actually I think the original thought link reference was um was Rome FM's graph where like I was listening to the podcast while looking at your transcript. I think yeah. one of the first few episodes I was looking at a transcript and uh and then I think at the point of time you it was set as read only. So I kind of copy and pasted it into my own room graph and then I was able to tag I was able to just like I was able to just uh, double parentheses and like double brackets and I was able to just see like oh you're talking to I can't remember who at the same time yeah and you're talking to and I was I was able to search like talk see every single instance of what she has said as I am listening to the thing it just creates a new visual experience for listening to a podcast or listening to something else and thinking about that um Second thing is like I'm working on an ebook. It's like it's called Soul Bits. It's just like little little raw bits of like my my own soul. And I'm thinking I am going to start working on that organically from a graph in itself. And like what I mentioned in the chat, where it's kind of, where the daily notes are going to be sort of like my change log. And I gain a lot of yeah. from the Rome change log in itself, where um where I'm working on a book and as I am working on a book, the graph itself, the network itself goes organically. It goes in this direction and then it goes little bit by little bit, little bit. And then the changes are being shown. I think I think that would be something worth monetizing itself because that is content that, and my own research will go into that. Yeah. Like my own research and my own notes will go into that. I think that's something worth monetizing itself because it is, instead of building it backwards from a book, you are building it ground yeah. up Boom, and that's the first building block, and people can see the context, and people can see that. So I, I thought that was that's something I intend to do, and I'm going to try and guinea pig that as well. So a couple of things. There are a number of points, but in the very beginning, I do agree to a certain extent. What we are selling is not knowledge. What we are selling is the articulation of said knowledge. So if like we'll just take a very good example, okay? So let's say let's say Brian, you you you. Like pick a topic that you really like to write about. Let's just say, uh, dance. let's <laughs> dance. Okay, let's say dance. Okay, let's say dance. And uh, oh, okay, RJ, see ya. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, thank, okay. thank you, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll head off in a bit. We'll head off in a bit. But but I I do want to close off. I'll probably want to close off on the points. Okay. So because I'm sure everybody else who is watching this up until now will want to hear. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so the first one is uh, we are selling the articulation and the connection of all of the uh, knowledge and insights that we gained as a result of our journey through the same knowledge, right? It's like, so as much as someone would pay to access this graph of knowledge, it's not they're paying to access this graph of true tacit knowledge. It's more like they are paying to access our version of that knowledge, like the conclusions that we came to, right? Mm. So I, I do agree. And the, the example I was going to bring up was like, okay, so Brian, let you, let's say you write a book about dance, right? And let's say Nassim Taleb writes a book about dance, okay? How, who would sell more books on dance? I mean, of course he would, but that is in a sense just then that also boils down to the marketing and no longer the product. Because yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. But and then how you market your own personal journey, I guess. But then we know Taleb, Taleb or Taleb, I assume Taleb, by the way that he articulates any topic, right? So the way that you would write about dance would be maybe with more visual aid, maybe with more anecdotes, with more stories, because you actually dance, right? Mm. Taleb maybe not a dancer, right? He's a deadlifter, right? He talks a lot of stuff on Twitter, which is fantastic, but he will be extremely technical. He'll be looking at academic papers. He articulates, he would articulate the topic way differently than you would, and that would attract a different set of audiences. So that can justify putting a price on it because people want to know what Taleb would think about this topic, right? Yep. Okay. So the second one was, I think I, I think I missed one, but, but on the, on the concept of trying to sell or put a price on a graph growing from, from, from the Genesis block all the way to its completion. 
I have a feeling you can do that. And the closest model will be crowdfunding. So imagine mm -hmm. that you have a landing page for saying, hey, I'm going to write a book about the following. Okay. You have to write down everything down to a detail. I'm not talking about like the actual blocks. I'm talking about a timeline. Like people, like you're asking people to commit, to pay money, to be with you all the way until the end, right? They need to know what they're paying for. So it's like, if say you, let's say it's like 200 pages, 20 stories, That's right? Let's say six months, I don't know, something like that, right? You want to know like what's happening every week. What are you doing week three? What are you doing month one? What are you doing month two? It's a bit like investing towards this result, this intended output. And the reason why is because if I'm paying for an empty graph on day one, I want to know why I'm there in the first place. Like I want, like I'm, I paid to see the first block on day one of your page, right? Like, are you going to do a live stream? Can I talk to you when you're writing this blocks? Um, you're doing a change log, right? So I can keep up with it. So that's perfectly fine. What can I expect? What am I paying for, right? Like I, I want to commit through my money. I want to commit through the experience of this graph growing over time. So I want to be there with you when you had a bad day in writing. I want there to be with you when you are researching this following story or this following topic. I want to be there with you when you have like a live chat with your fans and followers on the second week of the second month to get an update, like what's happening. If you're making any changes, I want to know, right? So it's a bit like crowdfunding, right? It'd be cool, like you're crowdfunding new graphs. I think that'd be pretty awesome. So why, why can't that just be a finished product? The way that I kind of envisioned it was like the finished product. Now that you mentioned crowdfunding it is, but it's like, at the same time, I just kind of feel like, man, I'm, I'm just a little shit. I just, I just, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to sell it for much. I'm just going to sell it for like five, ten dollars. No, no, and, it's a, no. It's a, that's the thing. Like that's the finished product, right? The finished product is the journey. Yeah, yeah. Right? The, I'm selling kind of like the like, encapsulate the journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but here's the thing. You're asking people to pay from day one, right? If you're halfway through the journey, you're three months in. And you want other people to pay? Do they? How do they justify paying the second half for the same amount? I feel like I don't really understand what what do you mean by like. So, so, like we said, like we're we are selling that journey, right? The encapsulated yeah. journey, right? Let's just say six months, right? Okay. <clears throat> you you market to people, and you're like, okay, I I'm I'm writing this book. I'm writing it in public in this graph. You pay, you get access to it. Okay. Pretty simple. Five dollars, something like that, right? Pretty simple. Three months in, lots and lots of setups, delays, maybe live chats, live events, talks with everything. That's three months of experience that has already passed. Now you can't access it anymore. If I just found your book for the first time, I want to pay. Yeah. Right. So I was thinking of just the book, the graph in itself is also kind of a finished product. Okay. So then now we're talking about. Uh, is it ends there? It's just yeah. It's like, okay. It's like okay. Yeah. So now we're only paying for access. Yep. Okay. Okay. okay so then, so then it's less about. So now it's less about crowdfunding. Now yep. it's more about, hey, do you want access to this graph? This is what I will do with it, right? And mm. that's it. Yep. Yeah, I think it will work. I think it will. That's just kind of the, the rough idea. Like, I, mm. like all, all the all the, oh my, because. I'm constantly block referencing my own journals and like kind of the purpose of this is like, I'm writing about um, 18 chapters of just personal anecdotes and just in different styles, metaphorical narratives, um, just even live conversations that I, I have. Yeah. And just writing, writing all these different styles. And it's really like, I don't intend to really make big box of this. It's just kind of something that I really want to do for myself and my own soul. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I my own soul. And I just thought it'd be it'll, it'll be cool, and that like today just kind of like got me thinking on a lot, of, a lot like, hmm. I think I think that'll be cool too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a possibility, right? Like it's, it's an option, right? It's an option, and it's only really like putting a price on it. It's it depends on your willingness and your vulnerability in doing so, and maybe someone it might help somebody else to see your journey in growing that craft. Like it it'll be like seeing. Like it, it'll be like, it, it'll be like, 
you getting the seeds for a flower yep. and someone paying to see you nurture it. Yep. Right? It's, like, it's, I, I'm looking at a bit like streaming, like where I'm just kind of doing things, but it is being recorded and like people are watching me do things. Something but like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like watching the board. Of it. They're watching it like retrospective feed. Yeah. I actually do have one question for you. Like, right. do you dive into other room graphs? And like what makes you want to dive into their room graph? Um, I, I was about to start reaching out to people to see if they would want me to like individual private graphs, if they would want me to look into their private graphs. Um and I think you were one of the people who actually asked. Uh but then yeah. there's one other person as well. Wow. So I was actually gonna reach out about that. Uh but that's for another time. Okay. Um, so, so for for the for the person watching this video, um, <laughs> yes, this is recorded. Okay, so so we're Brian, yeah. Brian, all all in, right? We're going all in. I did I did mention in the information for this event, recorded. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So anyway, um, that I made a joke tweet. I made a tweet out and said, "Do people want me to look into their graphs to?" bring up any prompts, bring up any questions, bring up any blocks of interest, anything like that. So a couple of people um, uh, brought up uh, interest in such. And uh, I, I haven't actually formally done it. The most I've done is with public graphs, but those are already all, shall we say, public shared databases. It's yeah. just, you know, it's just, a uh, a deposit of knowledge. It, I can't really play around with that that much, right? It's just something like, oh, that's cool, you know, like yeah. a like a public book. Like, like Brandon's one, and yeah. I, yeah, like you just kind of go in and just like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's like, and oh, that's it, like, and then you leave. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, <laughs> this is this is more about this is something more intimate and something maybe even private and confidential. So like, I have to be very careful about it. So, but I'll, I'll at least talk. I'll, I'll at least talk to you through what I think I might do. So say that. Uh, let, let's say that I'm, I'm doing this to your graph, right? Let's say that you invite me as an author or a viewer to your graph and I'm like, uh, I would probably ask you, what do you expect from me as I'm talking out loud while going through your graph? And then in response to that answer, I will start picking out blocks of interest. So it'll be like, oh, why is this block nested under this block? What does this mean? Oh, this is about a story. Oh, there's a block ref here. What does that mean? Oh, why did you why did you embed this block under this underneath this block, right? And these are important because one, it gives me, it sorry, this is important because it gives me two points of interest. One is the content that is within each block, and two, how you view Rome features. Your rationale for block references may be different from how I view Rome uh, block references. And maybe you, you don't even use embeds. Maybe you don't even use pages. I don't know, right? I mean- I don't use pages at all. <laughs> right, see, like, see, you don't use pages at all. Like, I'm gonna ask you why, right? I'm gonna ask you why not. I'm gonna ask you like, oh, this person's name keeps coming up, why, right? Like, like I, see, I see the word sad or I see the word crying a lot, right? Like the last seven days, I see the word depressed a lot. What does that mean? Tell me, right, okay? so. I'm going to play the role of the questioner inside your head and I will ask you why. And from there, it'll be a conversation yeah. where we, the both of us play the third party observer of your private Rome graph. So I will force you to confront your thoughts. Yeah, that's also fun, I love it. Right? Okay, <laughs> so, so that, that's what I think would happen, okay? And then the service then would just be like just the, the conversation and and a transcript and a backup of the talk, right? So I'll just give you all the files. It'll be up to you what you want to do with it, like the transcript and everything. And then you can do whatever you want with that. And I'll just leave it at that. Because all I'm looking for in that moment is the engagement behind, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna copy stuff from your blocks because I think that's too personal. It's like, it's yeah. a bit too much against my principle, but, but the, there's gold in the conversation between you and me. If I look into your graph and I find things that I, resonate with. And then I'll write it into my own graph thinking, oh, I was just looking at Brian's graph today. He talked about the following. What do I feel about it? Why do I disagree with him? Why do I agree with him? What does this remind me of? 
if I were to face this same situation in my private graph, how would I address it, right? Yeah. If I had uh, a lot of chaos due to the following feelings or due to the following fields, how would I address it? Who should I talk to to help address this, right? Like if I, if, if for example, we're talking about Alexander Technique and you yep. brought it up a lot in your graph and then we leave the conversation, I might just bring up Michael Ashcroft, right? Yeah. I might just bring up somebody else. I might just bring up somebody else. The conversation where me and you talking about your graph, and this, this is a secret behind Rome FM. Yeah. The conversations, conversations can be linked. Yeah. You can do bidirectional linking in conversations. That is the secret behind this podcast. And that is the secret behind how I use Rome research. Like there's a reason why I play around a lot on Twitter. Like everyone's it's, it's conversations. Everything is a conversation. If everything is a conversation, then everything can be linked. And that is a secret. So like, you know, that's my thought process. <laughs> yeah. Thank right. you. Thank no you. worries. Yeah. And uh, we'll probably end this off. So uh, yeah. honestly, Brian, thanks so much. Uh, thanks Let for coming. I'm in KL. Okay. <laughs> Dude, you're so, you're so close, but so far, uh, I've been wondering, it's like, uh, uh. yeah, it, it, it is quite far. Oh, wait. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Thank